All right, everyone. So for day two, I've got another document for you where in the first day of class, I talked about SEO and SEM are really tied together. SEO is search engine optimization. SEM is search engine marketing. So both of those concepts are integral nowadays for your websites to be found. SEO, which very basically is things that you do on your website. And SEM, very basically, is things you do outside of your website. We're going to touch on things such as social media a little bit later. And that's SEM, because it's outside of your website and it's what you're doing to market your website. SEM, search engine marketing. And we'll be talking, of course, what do you do on your website to get found. That's SEO, basically. So last week I gave a few documents in that network folder. There was the company profile that if you don't have an idea of what your company is, you're going to have a harder time optimizing for it. So last week I gave the company profile document, and again, as I said, you don't have to fill it out and turn it in. You're not going to get a grade. These class, My classes are not like that. You don't get any grades or certificates or anything. You get what you put into it. I can, of course, look at your answers if you'd like and give you advice and such. And as I said last week also, I have lab time at the end of the day for some individual help. Along the same lines, I've also got the client marketing strategy, which is today's document. Both of those Word documents that I give you are documents, variations of documents that my company, PMD Interactive, uses when we get clients. When we get hired by a client, uh, we need to know everything that we can about that client to best optimize them, to best market them on social media, etc. Because the best people to do that job the best are the people that work in the business, the owner of the business, the employees, etc. And if we're coming in as an outside company and we're going to claim to run Facebook for them well or optimize their website well, then we need to know their website well. So these two documents help us if my company were getting hired by a client. And I'm giving you these documents here for you yourself to look at to see do you have these concepts defined? Do you have them codified in a way that you can use them on your website or social media, etc.? So let's look at the marketing, the client marketing strategy document. I'll explain what's in it. And again, you don't have to fill this out and turn it in. The printer's not on, so don't worry about printing it. But if you'd like me to take a look at any of that, uh, I can during the, the lab time. So basically, it's a two-page document, but it's pretty dense. Uh, the first page, you would just put in the information of your company with a date and such, because this is probably going to be evolving as time goes on. You might have an idea of what to write this week, this month, this year, but then in a year or a month or two, it changes. So I've got all of these questions that you need to ask yourself about your company, things to define, um, starting off with what do you want to accomplish? You have a presence online for a reason. Are you trying to sell something? Are you trying to build awareness? Are you artistic and want people uh, to appreciate your work? Do you have a group you belong to that needs more members? Take a moment to write about what you want to accomplish with your online presence, which would be your website, your social media, whatever it is your online presence is. And I've got an example here. Remember this fictional company from last week. Vic.co wishes to create a powerful social media presence because we want to interact with existing customers and through word of mouth reach new customers. We want to connect with people on Instagram in a very visual way. So that sort of sentence there is what I would be looking for, what I would be trying to get out of a potential client when the question is, what do you want to accomplish? If they simply say, sell my product. Okay, that's a starting point. What's your product? Who are you targeting it to? And a bunch of other questions. And are you simply getting online because everyone's telling you you need to be online? Yes, it's important to be online, but are you only going to focus on a website? Are you also going to get on social media? Are you going to blog? Are you going to use your online presence as tech support? Are you going to sell your products online or over the phone? What are you trying to accomplish online? If you have that better defined, your SEO efforts will work out 
more likely. This can be as long as you want, of course. It can be just yourself, or if there are other interested parties in the company that have a say, they can contribute to it. But the problem, of course, too many cooks in the kitchen spoils the broth. And so if you've got lots of opinions about what all of these answers are, you may be just running around in a committee trying to figure out an answer instead of actually getting something done. So you have to figure out who is your target audience. It's important to focus on a target audience. It's nice to say that everyone would be interested in your product or your cause or group or whatever, but it just isn't true in the real world. Who are the people that would like to know about your product? What are their age ranges, gender, economic group, musical style? In short, who would care about your product? In essence, we are creating a persona of a potential client. So we would say in my example company, the people who want to hire Vic.co are people that are trendy but know what they want. They are people that are in their 30s who are successful, own their own company, need a new website, and know the value of web design. So again, if you think, who wants your product, who wants to know about you, who do you think wants to know about you or your product, you have to really be specific. I have this concept here of a persona. This is a marketing tactic uh, in, the, in the field of marketing, in that instead of creating a product and simply trying to sell it to a person or a nameless group, we actually develop a person, a persona a real person that we make up that would be interested in our product. And this can be pretty complex. This can be someone with an actual name and, uh, and a story and, uh, and a home that they live in and everything. Here's a very condensed version of it that people that are in their 30s, trendy, but know what they want, uh, they're successful, they need a website, and understand the value of web design. So the big companies do this, Coca-Cola, Nike, and uh, Starbucks, and all of them. They have a huge marketing arm where they pay people thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, to figure out all of this marketing. They develop these personas. John Smith is a person that is into this, this, and that, and is in this age bracket and income bracket, and therefore we're going to sell our product to them this way. We have this product, but we can also sell it to Janet, who's in a lower economic bracket, who has lower education, but it would be better to sell to her this way. So personas. Who are we marketing to? Who are we targeting? And what I've said here, it's a pretty dense answer, but for this company that is a web design company, Vic.co, that's who we're targeting, because we can make a website for anyone. But we're saying we're going to focus on this age range, we don't want to focus perhaps on older people because sometimes they don't get technology. They don't understand why they're hiring us for $5,000 to make their website because their cousin can make it for two hundred. dollars They uh, have their own business. We want to work with those that own their own business. And then again here I have the value of web design and that's figurative and literal. That they understand figuratively that a good website could get them traffic and sales and all of that. But understand that the value literally is it's going to cost a good amount of money. You're not going to get a good website out of $200, out of $1,000. You know, a $5,000 website, now we're talking, because that can be a much more robust and powerful and useful kind of website or online presence, especially if it's selling something online. You're not going to set up a very good e-commerce website for under $3,000. Um, so that's who we're targeting. Once we start to reach that audience, we are going to be more successful in our online endeavors. Maybe, uh, maybe we're trying to reach this particular audience and all of, those, all of these are checked off except the value or except the age range. You can make compromises, of course, but it's up to you to decide what sort of ag how much aggravation you'll take. The more that you can target this persona that you're, you know, the more that you can reach this persona that you're targeting, the better, with less compromises. Do you have an aspirational competition? It's good to have role models, both in life and in business. Is there a business you see that makes you think, I want to be like that, or a business that makes you think, I want to do that, but better? List the company, brand, person, etc. 
that you feel is in competition with you that you would like to emulate. Why do you want to emulate them? Vic.co feels that XY Designs is our aspirational competition because they are well known in the field of web design and their style is unique and modern. We did an aspect of this last time, which was the competitor analysis. I don't remember if I said that word last time, but what we did at the end of the day was competitor analysis. We checked out the competition based on your keywords about what websites are out there that are your competition. We did competitor analysis. And so if we know who the competition is, we can see what are they doing right Perhaps what are they doing wrong? What are they doing right? But what can we do more right? What can we do better than the competition? And you don't have to define this competition very narrowly. Uh, for example, one of the clients that I'll show an example of, they're a restaurant, a Mexican food restaurant. Um, when we started this a few years ago, this, this new phase of their company a few years ago, we asked them this question, we asked the owner this question, and, and he said, well, my, I feel my competition, who I'm really trying to be like or be better than, is Phil's Barbecue. How many of you are familiar with Phil's Barbecue? It's a local San Diego barbecue shop, one of the biggest ones. They've got uh, a lot of name recognition and such. And what was interesting was, this is a Mexican food restaurant selling barbacoa de borrego, which is Mexican lamb barbecue. And when I think of barbecue, I think of, you know, American-style barbecue, which of course is, do you mean Kansas City barbecue, Texas barbecue, etc. But this is Mexican barbecue. Different. It doesn't have the sauce and all of that. So then we thought, well, okay, why are you in competition with them if, first of all, they're an American barbecue shop, you're a Mexican barbecue shop, they, their beef and your lamb? They said, well, um, Phil's Barbecue is known in San Diego as the go-to place, you may or may not agree with it, but the go-to place for barbecue in San Diego. They have a line out the door, there's a sign that says something like 40 minute wait at this point, like, you know, Disneyland. Um, and uh, he's got, you know, P uh, Phil's Barbecue has people waiting to get in, in, the, in the store Monday through, fr uh, Monday through Saturday you know, all week long. Um, and so this client wants to be like that, that they have, that they're synonymous with, you know, good Mexican food or authentic Mexican food or traditional Mexican food in San Diego. They want to have a line out the door of people waiting to get in seven days a week. At the moment, they do on weekends. They want to do that also throughout the week. And so my point is, this competition doesn't have to be exactly what your business is, because you're going to say, I'm the only certified uh, dog walking company in San Diego. Okay, great. But there's plenty of other dog walking companies in San Diego. There's plenty of other pet groomers, pet sitters that can also do what you're doing. They might not have the exact certification that you have, but that's your competition. So who are you aspiring to be so that you can figure out what they're doing and you can do it better? Last week we talked about a mission statement. This week we've got a vision statement. A mission statement tells the world where you stand. A, mission, a vision statement tells the world where you're going. Write a statement that makes predictions about what you want to accomplish as a company or brand. You may set a time horizon, five years for example, also. Vic.co will be known for providing eye-catching web design for San Diego's most elegant restaurants. Last week, the mission statement was something like uh, providing... Well, let me look it up before I make it up. Last week... Mission statement. Vic.co exists to bring the most beautiful web design to the most discerning clients from Southern in Southern California. Our designs will make everyone take notice. So that's what we're doing right now as that fictional company. 
what our reason for being in that company is right now. Um, creating great looking websites. That's our mission, creating great websites. The vision, which is what we want to accomplish in the future, is um, that we'll be well known for eye-catching designs for San Diego's most elegant restaurants. We're targeting there that persona that's our, our audience, elegant restaurants. That's what we want to be known for in San Diego. We want to uh, be a big name in web design in San Diego for restaurants, because obviously we can make websites for everyone, but we are targeting, we're being specific. So that's what our vision statement is about. What are we going to accomplish? I didn't write a time horizon on that example, but that could be in five years, in three years, in ten years. And so then again, another, uh, another way, or another reason why we're writing a lot of this stuff is this creates the content that we're going to use to populate our website, to populate our social media, to develop our keywords um, so that we can get found. Because if you, if you only focus on the aspect of SEO, keywords and such, yeah, that's only half, that's only half the, the piece of the puzzle. You need to focus on these other aspects as well to create a fuller online presence so that you can get found by the search engines. And at the end we have the USP, the Unique Selling Proposition. What do you provide your customers that no one else can? What makes you stand out from the rest? How do you uniquely solve their problems? Answer the question of why. That is, why would a client hire you? Vic.co is based in San Diego, and many from our team graduated from Southwestern College, San Diego State University, and UCSD. Um, therefore, we know the local culture. We can create compelling websites that cater to San Diego companies. I touched on this last week when we talked about the golden circles. And, uh, and that book, um, Start With Why, from the author Simon Sinek. Um, the concept is uh, we can easily answer a what and a how, but the why is much harder. Why would my company be hired? Why would my product resonate with a potential uh, customer? Uh, why should I be hired? And so here I'm giving the example, like I said last time, we're a local San Diego-based web design company. We know that you can hire web designers all over the U.S., all over the world. We know that you can get a very affordable um, website um, from foreign labor, sure. But we are local. We know the culture. We graduated from here. We live here. We, we like San Diego, and we understand San Diego, and we're going to focus on companies in San Diego. Uh, so that we're in the same time zone, so that we understand not to get on the 5 at 3 o'clock and all of that. So that's what's unique about us to get us hired for our target, which is San Diego restaurants. Obviously, we can make websites for anyone in the U.S. or the world, but we're going to be focusing on San Diego. Because if you try to please everyone, you won't please everyone. You're trying to please everyone, you won't please anyone. And so this document here, as we get to the part about perhaps editing our website or talking about social media and such, many of these things will also apply. Will also apply there. Let's say we get on Facebook or Twitter and we're trying to reach people to build them a website where we're going to be searching these keywords or these demographics to to find a potential customer. So it all ties together. SEO, SEM, marketing, and optimization. And maybe at the moment this seems pretty nebulous or a lot to think about, and that's fine. This is not an assignment. You don't need to turn it in. This, uh, uh, I'm not saying you have to answer all of this. You can add one, a one-sentence answer to all of them, that might be fine as a starting point, but the deeper that you can get into it, the better. And I'm happy to look at it during the lab time if you're interested for a second opinion. 
but uh, lots to think about. But any questions on this document? Can you get a lot of pushback on people's voice that this is about? Not really, because we always sell it in a way about, you know, this is going to help you. If you're going to reach the right audience, you need to know who that audience is. You don't want to live in a bubble. You have competition. So we always sell it in a way about this is very valuable, valuable to fill out. So not really. Maybe people fill it out very briefly, and that's okay. But usually it does end up getting pretty complex as time goes on. Maybe the client doesn't fill it out very, very deeply the first week or month or year. But then when they start to realize how important it is, then it gets filled in much more completely, and it changes. That's why I have here a spot to put a date, because it might change. Version 2. Any other questions? Is there a non-read version of this written? A non-what? It says mine says read only. You should be able to, I think there might be a button at the top somewhere to activate editing. Okay. I think that's just our particular Word software might not have it editable automatically, so it should be editable. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you see? Does it show it? Or? All right, so um, those two documents, the company profile and the marketing strategy, obviously pretty valuable. There's, uh, you probably never thought of any of that, but if you think about it and apply it, it will, you'll be better off. Again, I don't have the printer on at the moment. I don't really recommend you print it. It's something to fill out. And this can, of course, evolve. So based on what we talked about last week, it should make it be making a bit more sense why we would work with this. Let me give you another document. We'll shift gears a little bit. So uh, any questions before I give you this other document? What we're going to talk about are the webmaster tools. Um, we have a website. Um, I said last week, if you come to the class and you don't have a website, you'll still be able to take the class. You'll still be able to apply what we talk about um, as uh, time goes on. But ideally, you have a website. So today what we're going to do is, last week I said if you, if you have a website, come with your login information so we can connect the webmaster tools to your website. But before we do that, I've got a document for you. Because the search engines, the big ones that we're going to talk about are Google and Bing. Now, Google has about 60% uh, market share and Bing has about 20% market share. So that's 80% of the global traffic right there. And both of the search engines, those search engines, they give you do's and don'ts about what to do and don't do on your website because SEO is a moving target. What used to work a few months ago or years ago maybe doesn't work anymore and maybe even hurts you now. In the old days, simply keyword stuffing is what you wanted to do. You wanted to develop your keywords and put that keyword on your web address, on your heading, in every paragraph, in your keywords, uh, in your alt text, everywhere. Because the search engines back then didn't understand your site unless they saw these keywords. Well, if you understand that strategy, so do the spammers. So the spammers would, instead of using real keywords, put every word in the dictionary on their site. So then, obviously, that keyword is going to hit. They'd even do these really uh, insidious things, such as um, putting, 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 white text on a white background. Black text on a white background, you can read it. White text on a white background to us is invisible. 
but to the search engines, they would see it. The search engines see text, not color. So we wouldn't see that all of these keywords would be hidden in the white areas. But the search engines would, and then the search engine would say, oh, this, it's got these keywords, obviously it's a good site based on those keywords. Well, no, the spammers were using techniques that were, um, that were detrimental. So now we don't want to do keyword stuffing. We don't want to get these simple keywords, web design, affordable, and put them all over the website in an artificial way the uh, SEO target moves. So that's what we're going to be talking about in detail. And that technique that I just mentioned of sort of doing these tricks to fool the search engines, that's known as black hat SEO. Black hat SEO. Um, that comes from uh, the old cowboy movies. So on the cowboy movies, when, when the bad guys would come and take over the town and, and shoot everyone up, the bad guys, what kind of hat were they wearing? A black hat. The bad guys were wearing black hats. And then the sheriff, the good guy, what kind of hat was he wearing? A white hat. So we'll be talking about white hat SEO techniques, the good techniques, the ones that the search engines recommend, the ones that are modern and effective. We won't use the black hat techniques, those dirty tricks that don't work anymore or might hurt you now. And in the middle, yes, there is also the gray hat techniques. Uh, and I avoid those usually as well because who knows how things change, and then those become gray into black. So we'll be talking about white hat techniques, the good techniques, the modern techniques. Well, how do we know what the good and modern techniques are? They come straight from the search engines. They provide webmaster tools. They provide documentation and videos and everything on how to, how to do all of this. So I'm going to provide you another document that introduces us to that. Let's go back to the desktop and back to the computer window. I just added this a moment ago, so if you access the folder earlier today, you'll need to go back. I just added it. Open up computer window again, top left. And then go into network location. Double click classroom network location. Scroll down to find my folder, campus SEO. And I just added a document that you want to drag to your desktop. Don't double-click it in the folder. That's going to lock it. You want to drag it to your desktop. SEO number two, Webmaster Tools. Last week I gave number one, and the syllabus, and the company profile, and the long tail graphic. This week I'm giving the marketing strategy, which we just looked at. And now we'll look at this one together. So copy SEO to Webmaster Tools. Drag that to your desktop. Then double click it to view it. Again, the printer's off. I'll turn it on during the break. Copy that over. Campus SEO to Webmaster Tools. Double click it. It should open up in um, Office. And we'll look at it. Did everyone get that? Does anyone need a little help finding that file? Okay, so this is another two-page document. Um, let's skip down to page two for a moment. Conversion goals. That's a buzzword that you see all the time, or simply the word conversions. Um, a synonym for conversion is goal. So this is, I guess, redundant. Conversion goals. That's like goal goals. But uh, conversions. Uh, you hear this term a lot in marketing. You hear it also in web marketing. Um, a conversion basically is a goal that is accomplished. You must decide the goals of your company early on. In my fictional business, here's another one, Victor's Bakery, I want people to buy my cupcakes. That's a conversion goal. In order to get to that goal, I may have many conversion goals before that point. They're called conversions because there's a person that is that has not bought the cupcake yet, and I want to convert them into a buyer of my cupcake. Um, so oftentimes conversions are measured with sales, or linked with sales, but they don't have to always be with sales. I have several examples here. So I'm going to try ultimately my main, my ultimate conversion is to sell cupcakes. But I have several along the way. Get followers on Twitter. Well, when we talk about social media in detail, 
And if you take my social media class, which is Tuesdays and Fridays this week, I'll mention it again later, but if you take the social media classes, you're going to learn in there the value of getting followers. For example, followers on Twitter. And not only do more followers on Twitter boost your ego, but they could potentially be more sales. Um, if you've got 10 followers on Twitter, that doesn't mean that those 10 will buy your product. Maybe one will buy a product. Maybe zero will buy a product. Well, let's say I've got 100 followers on Twitter. Maybe one will buy. Maybe 10 will buy. Not, not all 100. It's very easy to be on Twitter, but it's much harder to buy. Well, what if I've got 1,000 followers, 10,000 followers? If you think in terms of 1% really care, that's a really low that's a really low amount of people that could really buy your product. What is 1% of 100? It's a fraction, but let's round it up. One. One person out of 100 could buy your product. Um, if you go higher, you've got uh, you know 500 followers. That's five people that could really care. Now that is a very, very conservative number there, 1%. You could have a very dedicated audience that hangs at your every tweet. And maybe you have more of like 25% possible conversion followers. Okay, great. Even at 100 followers, that's 25 people. At 1,000 followers, you know, that's 250 people. Um, so the more followers you have, potentially you could have a larger target audience, a captive audience. We'll also talk about the value of social media as having a captive audience. Another goal, get social interactions, which would be likes or shares or comments on Facebook. Okay, another social network. I'm going to create a Facebook account. I'm going to post pictures of my yummy cupcakes, and I'm going to post coupons of my cupcakes and, uh, advice, and uh, sales that I'm going to, or ads that I'm going to have a sale this Saturday. Well, I want people to like my posts on Facebook to possibly comment and possibly share. Because a like is nice. A like does help um, you reach more of an audience, but a like is very disposable. A like is that I like that, I move on, what's next? That's cool. Like, what's next? It's kind of disposable. Uh, a higher level, so I should rearrange these actually, likes, comments, shares. Comments would be a little bit higher than a like because someone actually took a moment to write something. It could be something like, great. Or it could be something like, I really like that product and I bought it and it changed my life. Free advertising. And then the next level up, a share. That's that someone liked your post on Facebook so much that they want to share it to their friends. And I might have had seven followers on Facebook, but what if one of those followers had 700? So now that post could have reached 707 people, potentially. So getting those interactions to spread the word on my Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever. Another goal that I could have is get site visits via Google+, another social network. Google+, Plus is very much tied with Google search, Google Maps, YouTube, etc. And so if you have a presence on Google+, and I, I really like Google+, as a social network for businesses because they have something called communities, which is that when you're on Twitter, you're kind of like a, you know, a random person on the street talking to everyone. On Facebook, it's a little bit more exclusive, but then it's hard to break out of that exclusivity. Google+, Plus is really nice because it has aspects of both and communities, which is where you can congregate uh, with a bunch of people on a related topic. So I can join a variety of Google Plus communities related to baking, related to cooking, related to healthy living, and I can post stuff on those communities and get visits back to my website because I'm posting a great picture, but with a link back to my website to buy that cupcake. So I also want to get, try to get site visits from the different social networks, traffic back to my website because it's sort of a catch-22. How do you get traffic to your, your website? You use social media to get traffic to your website, but if no one knows about my social media, how do I get traffic? Well, you use social media to get traffic. It's kind of a 
kind of a conundrum. But the point is you want to be active on social media. That's a modern part of SEM, search engine marketing. That marketing that you're active on these networks will bring traffic, if you do it the right way, back to your website. More traffic breeds more traffic. The search engines will see there's all of these links and traffic going to this website. It's a good website compared to the competitor that has no traffic or less traffic than you. Another conversion, another goal that I'm trying to reach. Get more hits on my homepage. Well, obviously, I want more traffic to my homepage, to my website. How do I do that? That's the concept of the whole course and everything we're talking about. But think about it this way. I can be very successful on Google+, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, um, Instagram, etc., etc., etc. I can be very successful on those networks. I can have 5,000 followers on Instagram. What's the point if I'm not driving them back to my website? Because on my website is where I will sell them the product. At the moment, I can't sell my products through Instagram. I can't sell on Pinterest. I can't sell on Twitter. The big companies can. Walmart can sell you something on Twitter, and, and uh, Macy's can sell you something on Pinterest, but we're not Macy's big. We're not Walmart big. So we still need a website where we can sell our product, where we can solicit donations, where we can get the word out as, as an artist to come to my gallery, to sign up to RSVP for my gallery show. Whatever I'm trying to do online, Remember, it comes back to the document that says, what are you trying to do online? Usually you're going to accomplish it on your website. So I want to get traffic to my website because that's where I accomplish that via these possible methods. Let's say I get them to my website. How do I get them to stick around? Blogging. I also teach a class on blogging, maybe in a month or two. But blogging is valuable because that creates content the search engines will see that your website, it's not just these seven pages, it's these 20 pages. Uh, the more content the search engines see, the more it understands what your website is about without having to do these tricks of keyword stuffing and such. You're creating all of this great content blogging on a regular basis, and that could then get shared. That again, someone visits my website, they read a good blog post, and they click share on Twitter. I got some free advertising from someone that had 200 followers on Twitter. Maybe they really like my blog post and they share it on Facebook. And that gets shared by someone that has 500 friends on Facebook. Yes? That's a good question. The recent, the clients that we currently have at the moment, we haven't run any contests in a while now that I think about it. Um, so it's a bit anecdotal. I'm not quite sure about that. Anyone have an opinion on that? Have you seen any contests on Facebook recently? Have you seen any contests like in the last five years? Probably you've seen them in a while, but I, I don't think I've seen them very recently. We haven't really done any, but that is a viable thing to do. It depends on your demographic. Uh, if your audience is interested in a contest, you know, what are you going to offer as, as, as your prize? fleeting internet fame, a, a coupon, you know, what are you going to offer? So I think it's valuable, but now that I think about it, we haven't done any recently. And so I could have a blog post that is kind of a contest as well. We write something valuable, maybe we give away a free recipe. Grandma's original cookie recipe, chocolate chip cookie recipe. And uh, we write that blog post, and then uh, at the bottom we attach, what's your uh, family cookie recipe, submit it to join our contest and the best one will get a 50% off your next order. So that could entice people to then share that on their Pinterest to get more people uh, looking at my blog, my website, more traffic. Newsletters. Newsletters are could be valuable. Uh, you don't need to do all of these. The more of these that you do, the better. But here's another example, and a little bit later I will show you this great blog post on all of these great ideas that you can have about online marketing. But here's one. Newsletters. Um, I subscribe to a few newsletters. 
like Fry's Electronics, for example, and every time I get it, I'm tempted to just delete it because I always see so many great things I want to buy. And if I just got my paycheck, then it's even worse. So if you can entice people to sign up for your newsletter, like I'm, uh, I've got a, a newsletter where you get exclusive coupons. That's how you entice people. Not just please sign up for my newsletter. Sign up for our newsletter for exclusive coupons. So then what you've done is you've, you've convinced people to give you their email address so you can market to them. So you can send them that weekly or monthly or daily uh, email newsletter. You have to, of course, be careful because maybe a daily newsletter is way too much and people will unsubscribe. But that's, uh, that's a captive audience that really chose market to me um, so that you can send out these promotions and such. And also, follow us on Facebook. Don't forget to follow us on Snapchat and all of that. So getting more subscribers, more traffic to your site. Get virtual clients, which are your followers, to come to my physical location. I want those people locally that are on Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or Snapchat or Instagram, etc. I want them to actually come to my store because in my case, my bakery is a physical location. I do sell online, but if they come to the store, that's going to be better because they can buy more or they can use exclusive coupons and such. So that obviously is a big, there's a lot of uh, details about that because I might have a thousand Twitter followers, but only maybe 20 are in San Diego. Maybe 50 are in San Diego, but how many of those 50 am I going to convince to come to the store this Saturday? Um, again, very small amount. But if I can get them to come to the store, perhaps then I can complete my final, my ultimate conversion, get the client to buy my cupcake. You should see that it's a long, involved process, process from point A, a potential client follows you on Twitter, to point Z, the follower visits the store and buys a product, either a physical location or on your website. This is why search engine optimization goes hand in hand with search engine marketing. Twitter, Facebook, all of that stuff. Newsletters, blogs. So, because it's very easy to get a follow on Twitter, relatively, but it's very much harder to actually make a sale, depending what your product is. So the more of these that you can accomplish and understand and do on a regular basis, the better. I have a note here. Also, an emerging term that takes both into account SEO and SEM is content marketing. And you can read that article there. What is content marketing? Over at Forbes.com. Uh, so it's an article from a big magazine about entrepreneurship. And they're talking about content marketing. That might be the new keyword. Although SEO is so ingrained at the moment from, from regular people, regular people are starting to understand the concept of SEO. The people in the business now are talking a little bit more in content marketing. So if you hear that buzzword, content marketing, it's just taking into account SEO and SEM a little bit more tied together. You can read that article. Any questions on these concepts of page two? It is a lot to think about, but that's why any good class that is about SEO really needs to think about also and address SEM. And that's why I also offer a variety of classes related to each other. If we were going to, if we were going to cover all of these topics in depth in this class, it would be, you know, four months long. So many of these concepts are broken out. They're like spin-offs of this, of this class. If you really want to get better at social media, I teach a couple of, of social media classes. If you really want to get better and understand more about blogging, I teach a blogging class. Um, so you can look at the catalog for that. Now let's back up to the first page. We're going to look at these things and we'll actually accomplish some stuff in a moment. We're about to take a break in a bit. But in general, let me tell you what we're about to do. The concept here is that nowadays it's harder to be found by potential clients. There's so much competition. The best advice to rank, however, comes straight from the search engines themselves. They will provide you the documentation, the do's and the don'ts. 
and a means to check if it's working. So we've got a section on Google Webmaster Tools and a section on uh, Bing Webmaster Tools. We're going to look at both. Once we've learned the concept of one, it will apply to the other relatively easy. So that's what I said last week. If you've got a website, we're going to connect the search engines directly to your website, so bring your password. Um, if you're new this week, you might be able to to bring up that password. If you can't quite do this here, no problem. Just take notes, watch the video when you get home, and do it at home. But we're going to do this together. We're going to explore this. But um, let's take a moment to take a break, actually. I'll turn the printer back on. Uh, and when we come back, we'll start to do this together to link the, the search engines with your website to get the most results. Um, we'll actually start with Bing first, because that one once you learn it from one, you'll be able to apply it to another. We'll start with Bing. So it's uh, 6.57. We'll be back in 10 minutes, uh, 7.07, and then we'll go on.